Often we see viral videos of gators on Florida golf courses. This time it was a driver running through red lights to hit the green. Police tried to pull a woman over after she did not comply. The driver tried to get away and broke into a golf course and began driving around the green. Police were finally able to stop her. No one was injured and the driver was arrested and is now facing DUI charges. Tonight, our rare access into the CDC's war room as they brace for a winter surge to possibly get even worse. Dr. Jen Ashton with the CDC director reviewing the Omicron variant and what concerns her most, but also promising early findings about how effective Pfizer's booster shot may be against the new variant. But what about Moderna? Dr. Fauci weighs in on it all. The trial now underway of the former police officer charged with manslaughter for shooting and killing unarmed Dante Wright during a traffic stop. The emotional testimony in court today from Wright's mother and her final phone call with her son. Popular social media app Instagram under fire tonight on Capitol Hill. The company's CEO facing tough questions today at a bipartisan hearing. This comes after a Facebook whistleblower recently came forward, leaking internal research and testifying to lawmakers that Instagram has a toxic effect on some teens. Tonight, our conversation with a white teacher who says he was fired after he taught his students about white privilege. Whenever we get uncomfortable, you know, by these very powerful pieces, we have to really ask ourselves, what are we uncomfortable by? Hillary Clinton's emotional new video. I am as sure of this as anything I have ever known. America is the greatest country in the world. For the first time, she shares the speech she planned to give had she won the 2016 presidential election. See the moment that brought her to tears. And celebrating her 104th birthday, the TikTok sensation, letting Gen Zers know what's up. What can they do? What can they do to live as long as you? What can work, they do? Work hard and, and, and to me, that's how I got it. Got to hear her advice coming up there. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with what could be some promising news on the Omicron variant as Delta continues to surge across unvaccinated pockets of America. Pfizer announced early data suggests three doses of its vaccine, including a booster, were effective against the Omicron variant. But as we've been stressing, there is still a lot we do not know about it. That early data, though, does suggest Omicron may be less severe than the Delta variant, but it also appears to be highly transmissible and could ultimately infect more people. Our Dr. Jen Ashton is at the CDC in Atlanta tonight getting an up-close look at the CDC's war room where they are monitoring every case of Omicron. The CDC director telling our team the very latest information they have. The winter surge already in full force. More than 117,000 new cases every day nationwide. That's up 46 percent just in the last week. If Omicron takes over, there's concern about hospitals that are already running out of space. Our Whit Johnson leads us off tonight. Tonight, Pfizer releasing early data suggesting two shots plus the booster appear to stand up against the new variant and could be a key tool in the fight against Omicron. Dr. Anthony Fauci saying the news makes him, quote, breathe a little better. When you get that third shot boost, it dramatically increases the level of laboratory projected protection. This is good news about the booster protection. Early results from Pfizer found that high levels of antibodies from a booster may better defend against Omicron. But when the standard two-dose vaccine took on the new variant, antibody levels dropped 25 times lower. Pfizer saying two doses may not stop infection, but are still likely effective in preventing severe disease. People should go and get their third dose now, not wait. Pfizer's data coming on the heels of a small study out of South Africa that also found Omicron appeared to chip away at two doses of the vaccine. Here in the U.S., cases of Omicron have been detected in at least 21 states. Our Dr. Jen Ashton today getting a rare look inside the CDC's war room where scientists are tracking Omicron across the country. CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky showing us the many mutations. These are all the mutations. These are the spike protein. Yep. These are all the mutations. While early signs show Omicron might be less severe than Delta, they still believe it's highly transmissible, that it spreads easily, and has them concerned about the sheer numbers. We have some concerns about this new variant in terms of its transmissibility. We don't know what it's going to do in terms of disease severity, but um, even if it is 
not more severe. If we have many, many people who get it, more denominator. we have a lot, right, we have a much larger denominator and we could be in a problem with the numer with, you know, with um, disease severity anyway, because there are just more people who have it. But right now, it's the Delta variant making up nearly all new cases nationwide, an 83% increase since late October. Hospitals feeling the surge, even in highly vaccinated areas like the Northeast. Delta is incredibly infectious. And those, uh, you know, 5 to 10 percent of the people that um, haven't been vaccinated, um, that's who Delta is going at right now. In Massachusetts, one trauma center at UMass Memorial running out of beds. There's 75 patients waiting in the ER for a bed including seven ICU patients, and there's really no end in sight, which is the scary part for all of us. And hospitalizations in Connecticut doubling in the last month. Right now, 100% of our patients who are admitted to the hospital at Greenwich Hospital, 100% are unvaccinated. 100% Right here. now, today. Every day, it's a little bit like going into battle, and we recognize that this is not over yet. This current wave driven by the highly transmissible Delta variant. And tonight, Dr. Walensky warning about the impact of another highly contagious variant like Omicron. If we have a much more transmissible variant, you end up with a much larger population of people with disease and then even small amounts of that very large population that end up in hospital. You end up with a real crisis at the hospitalization level and, and potentially lots of poor outcomes. Whit Johnson joins us now. Whit, what's the latest information that the CDC has on those that they have identified with the Omicron variant? Lindsay, Dr. Walensky, the CDC director, says more than 40 people in the U.S. have been infected with the new Omicron variant. Of those, more than three quarters of them were fully vaccinated and about a third had received booster shots. But she says almost all of those cases have been mild. Lindsay? All right, some positive move, news there. Whit Johnson, our thanks to you. Next to the dramatic first day of trial for former police officer Kim Potter, you may recall that she shot and killed Dante Wright during a traffic stop in Minnesota, claiming that she mistook her handgun for a taser. Today, Wright's mother was the first witness to take the stand. ABC Stephanie Ramos is in Minneapolis for us. Tonight, an emotional start to the criminal trial of former police officer Kim Potter, accused in the death of 20-year-old Dante Wright. Potter, a 26-year veteran of the police department, in the courtroom today. She faces first and second degree manslaughter charges after shooting Wright in the chest last April. The defense says she mistook her taser for her gun. Katie Bryant, Wright's mother, called as the prosecution's first witness. I wanted to protect him because that's what mothers do. Bryant detailing the last phone call with her son as he was pulled over for an air freshener in the rearview mirror, which is illegal in Minnesota, and an expired tag. He just sounded really nervous, but I reassured him that it would be okay. The call abruptly ending, that mother later making a video call, a woman in the car with Wright answering the phone. She said that they shot him. And she faced the phone towards the driver's seat. <laughs> and my son was laying there. He was unresponsive and he, he looked <laughs> Bryant rushing to the scene. I didn't want to believe that that was my son laying there on the ground, but I could tell it was him because of his tennis shoes. <laughs> During that traffic stop, Wright struggled with officers who were attempting to apprehend him after discovering an outstanding warrant for his arrest. Potter pulling out a firearm. Realizing she had shot Wright as the car drove off. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. And Stephanie, the prosecution argued that as a veteran of the police force, Potter should have realized the difference between her taser and gun. Exactly, Lindsay. The prosecution said that she's been on the force for so many years, she should have known where her taser was located and where her gun was located. So this is something that we are bound to hear come up over and over. And we also heard from the defense. They tried to place, well, they actually placed the blame on Wright, saying that had he stopped, he'd still be here. And it sounds like we expect Potter to take the stand in her own defense. 
Yes, Lindsay, we expect Potter to take the stand sometime next week. We don't have an exact day yet, uh, but sometime next week we should see her there taking the stand in her own defense. Lindsay. Stephanie Ramos, our thanks to you. And for more on this trial, we bring in ABC News contributor and attorney, Shauna Lloyd. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Shauna. As Stephanie reports, Kim Potter is charged with first and second degree manslaughter. There's no murder charge here. So what exactly does the prosecutor have to prove? What they have to prove here is that both of these charges, manslaughter in the first degree and second degree, are for accidental killings. First degree is really going to require an act that made it reasonably foreseeable that a death would be caused by this negligent action. When we talk about manslaughter too, what they're essentially going to have to prove is that she created a risk that could have been, un that was unreasonable, thereby causing the death. So it's all about the reasonableness of her actions and whether or not her actions were, if they were unreasonable, whether that unreasonable risk created the death. Now, Potter's lawyer said that this was simply a tragic mistake and that Potter thought she needed to tase Dante Wright because another officer was leaning into the passenger side window and thought that he could be killed if Wright decided to drive off. Her attorney said this. This was an accident. She's a human being. If she does nothing, Mr. Wright drives away and either substantially harms Sergeant Johnson or more likely, he kills him. Did that sound like a persuasive argument to you, Shauna? You know, when you hear this argument, I think it comes down to the body-worn camera. With the video is going to be very persuasive or not persuasive in this because what we're going to see is where the officers were, were, what their positions were, and how much in danger they seem to be at that moment. And I think the jury is going to be looking very closely at each of those other officers and their body-worn camera to determine if they were actually in harm's way and how much of a risk she created by pulling out her taser, which turned out to be her gun. So much of this tragic incident was all caught on tape. What more could we learn from witnesses and potentially from Potter herself that we didn't already see in this video? What that's going to show us, Lindsay, is the context, right? What they were thinking going into this event, what were their thoughts, their their state of mind, you know, the, the those kind of reactions that a video can't capture. What was in her head? Because at that moment, that is what the jury is going to be determining. Were her actions reasonable? Was it reasonable for her to not know that she had a gun instead of a taser? And really, that's going to come from the circumstances that were happening, how fast it happened, and what was going through her mind at that time. Shauna Lloyd, our thanks to you as always for your insight. Always a pleasure. Now to the tense moments on Capitol Hill today, where the head of Instagram was grilled by Congress over the platform's impact on young users. Senators are now calling for bipartisan legislation in the hopes of reforming big tech. ABC congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the details on the fiery exchange for us. Tonight, the head of Instagram appearing before Congress for the first time, defending the popular social media app from blistering bipartisan criticism that Instagram is toxic for children, especially young girls. How do you square a business model that prioritizes user time and engagement with knowing there's a direct correlation between time and harm? Senator, respectfully, using our platform more will increase any effect, whether it's positive or negative. But if people don't feel good about the time that they spend on our platform, that's something I personally take seriously. Adam Osseri pointing to outside research showing more teens use TikTok and YouTube. And today, introducing a new safety net hours before that hearing, telling lawmakers the company will take more steps to protect children, including prompts to suggest users take a break and other parental controls. But senators say the damage has already been done. Instagram is addicted. Senator, respectfully, I don't believe the research suggests that our products are addictive. He clearly disagrees with that categorization. Rachel Scott joins us now from the Capitol. Rachel, how does that testimony from the head of Instagram today compare to the whistleblower that we heard from earlier this fall? It directly contradicts uh, with what the whistleblower told lawmakers just weeks ago, accusing the company of choosing profit over safety. That whistleblower came forward and said that the company actually had documents pointing to the fact that Instagram was addictive for teens as young as 14 years old. And as for those new parental controls that are supposed to be added to Instagram, well, those will not be in effect until March, Lindsay. All right, Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. 
We are joined now by House Intelligence Committee Chair Congressman Adam Schiff, a member of the January 6th Select Committee, and he's also one of the lead sponsors on a bill coming before the House this week called the Protecting Our Democracy Act, aimed at preventing future presidents from breaking traditional ethics and governing norms. Congressman Schiff, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to be with you. So uh, we'll get to the details of the Protecting Our Democracy Act in just a moment, but I do want to begin with the news about former Trump Chief of Staff Mark Meadows backing away from cooperating with the January 6th committee, which says that it will now have no choice but to recommend he be held in contempt of Congress. First, when will that likely happen, and do you believe that the Justice Department should pursue criminal contempt charges as it did with Steve Bannon? Uh, I think it'll happen very soon, and yes, uh, I think, unfortunately, criminal contempt will be necessary. Uh, it's a very odd turn of events because he had decided to cooperate. Uh, he was producing documents, and in the production of those documents, uh, we can see that uh, there is no executive privilege that would apply to them. Uh, certainly questions about the documents he's already provided uh, can't be privileged. Uh, and his refusal all of a sudden to show up for his deposition today leaves us no choice. Uh, apparently, Mr. Meadows believes that uh, he can write about things in his book. He can write about conversations with the president about January 6th, but somehow he can't tell Congress about them. That's just not going to hold up with us, and we don't expect it would hold up with the Justice Department either. And as you just stated, the committee's letter to Meadows said that he had no legitimate basis for not cooperating, given that he's written a book now detailing his time in the Trump White House and because he had already shared some records with the committee. But his attorney notes that that was being done voluntarily and he was willing to answer questions related to issues that were not protected by executive privilege. Did the committee overstep at all in your efforts considering that he had been willing to testify at one time? Uh, no, not at all. And I think, uh, as you say, the lawyer is acknowledging these matters are not privileged. Uh, and therefore, Mr. Meadows doesn't have a right to simply say, I'm not going to bother showing up because the president I used to work for doesn't want me to or doesn't want uh, people to cooperate. Um, no, I think that's exactly what lands you in criminal contempt. Uh, we went forward with Steve Bannon. It's going to be necessary now to go forward with Mark Meadows. There should only be one standard here. No one should be above the law. E everyone should be equally uh, uh, required to uphold their lawful duty when they're subpoenaed. Uh, and we in intend to insist on that. So do you believe that you'll eventually prevail here in getting his testimony? Well, it all depends. Uh, you know, if the Justice Department moves forward uh, and prosecutes him, uh, whether he would be uh, willing to go to jail uh, to uh, maintain uh, this kind of a silence uh, or non-cooperation with the committee, whether he'd be willing to go to jail to deprive the American people of information uh, that they need to prevent another attack uh, on the building behind me. Um, I can't answer that for Mr. Meadows. Uh, only time will tell. Beyond Meadows, where would you say that the committee's work stands right now? I think we're making a lot of progress. Uh, most people are cooperating. Most people who are subpoenaed uh, are answering the call of the subpoena. And, uh, and so these are the outliers that you're seeing, uh, those that are deciding to thumb their nose uh, at their lawful requirements. But we're learning a great deal, and we're moving with, uh, I think, tremendous expedition. Uh, and, uh, and we feel a sense of urgency. There was an attack on the Capitol. Uh, people died. Uh, the same big lie that propelled people to attack the Capitol. Uh, many members of Congress, uh, the former president uh, is, as well, uh, are continuing to push that lie. If you persuade people that elections can't legitimately be used to decide who should govern, it opens the way for political violence. So, so we feel a real sense of urgency about our work. And let's turn to the Protecting Our Democracy Act, which will likely clear the House this week. Quickly just outline some of the points, the key aspects of this package, what they would do and why you believe that it's so necessary. What we discovered over the last four years was that so many of the norms that hold our democracy together that we thought were inviolate could be violated with impunity. Uh, and so this package of our own post-Watergate reforms uh, would do things like uh, expedite enforcement of congressional subpoenas, protect the independence of the Justice Department, guard against the abuse of the pardon power, protect inspector generals for being fired because they discover misconduct in the executive branch, protect whistleblowers, uh, make sure that presidents can't enrich themselves through office, uh, and that others don't use uh, the office as an instrument of their campaign, uh, and many other things, reforms that have been 
clearly uh, made necessary, as we have witnessed over the last four years. But importantly, they're about the future. They're not about the former president. They're about a future president and the need to make sure no future pe president abuses the power of their office. And you said earlier this fall when this bill was first announced, and, and I want to quote here, I realize many of the Republican members live in fear of angry statements from the former president. Uh, some of the measures in this bill appear to have bipartisan support, but is it realistic to expect 10 Republicans to sign on to this for uh, considering that the Senate, uh, much of it is a, a rebuke of the actions the former president took while in office? Uh, you know, it's a good question. We'll find out soon enough uh, when we take this up in the House. But you're absolutely right. Many of the provisions in this bill were authored by Republicans in the past. Uh, and Republicans should want to, the Congress to serve as a check on a Democratic administration. But whether the fear of the former president, the fear of doing something that would meet with his disfavor, uh, is going to overcome their devotion to their own institution, we will find out. Would you be better served, though, breaking this into smaller bills that can get clear bipartisan support so some of these measures actually get passed into law? Uh, indeed, some of the provisions in this bill have been taken up independently. Uh, they're running into, I think, some of the same roadblocks uh, in the Senate. Um, but we think that as important as the individual pieces are, they're really more important as part of a package because of what they say about the perilous state of our democracy and the comprehensive way we need to uh, fully safeguard our democratic institutions going forward. Congressman Adam Schiff, appreciate you coming back on the show. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. That conversation with Congressman Schiff happened earlier today and late today. We received word that Mark Meadows is now suing House Speaker Pelosi and members of the January 6th Select Committee to try to block enforcement of the subpoena for his testimony. We turn next to the sex trafficking trial of Ghislaine Maxwell. Jurors today saw new images of Maxwell with Jeffrey Epstein appearing to be a happy couple. Prosecutors calling them partners in crime. Jurors also heard the graphic and difficult testimony of a third accuser taking the stand. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. Tonight, these newly released images of Ghislaine Maxwell embracing Jeffrey Epstein, capturing a seemingly happy, wealthy, globe-trotting couple. Prosecutors presenting these photographs during the socialites' sex trafficking trial as they try to paint the two as partners in crime, with Maxwell allegedly leveraging her glamorous lifestyle to recruit and groom girls for sex with Epstein. The trial in its eighth day, with three accusers so far taking the stand. The latest alleged victim identified by her first name, Carolyn, claiming that she was just 14 years old when she first went to Epstein's home with a friend. After they arrived, Maxwell allegedly telling the friend, you can bring her upstairs and show her what to do. Carolyn testifying that Maxwell scheduled some of her explicit massages with Epstein and that on one or two occasions, Maxwell handed her the $300 payments. Good morning, Jeffrey. How do you think it's going? But Maxwell's defense team pointing to inconsistencies in Carolyn's story and questioning why she didn't implicate Maxwell until funds from Epstein's estate became available. And Lindsay, the prosecution is expected to rest tomorrow or Friday. Then Maxwell's defense team is expected to start laying out its case late next week. Lindsay. Ariel, thank you. When we come back, the military members patrolling the beaches of Cancun with guns as the situation in that popular tourist spot appears to become dicey. Our team in Ukraine once again tonight, how that Biden-Putin phone call is playing out over there. But up next, the white professor fired, he says, for teaching about white privilege. But did he go too far? You'll be the judge. Coming up next. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. When you think of the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, it's the Jen Shaw Show. Ah! 
She was the prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Jen Shaw pled not guilty to the charges that she's facing. I don't know if she knew that she was going to be arrested that day. But those braids, honey, those braids look good. Shaw, amazing, wild, unpredictable, rich woman. Sign me up. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. We now switch gears to an issue riling school communities across the country. How do we teach race and racism in America? Tonight, we speak with teacher Matthew Hahn, who was fired from a rural Tennessee high school after teaching high school kids about white privilege. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Hahn. Uh, let's just dive right in here. You taught a high school class called Contemporary Issues and discussed white privilege. You were then reprimanded for assigning an article titled The First White President, and you were terminated shortly thereafter uh, after you played a a video by a spoken word artist called White Privilege. Here's part of that video. What is white privilege? It is the only five decades of legal acknowledgement expected to correct 400 years of white transgression. Now, what did you want your students to learn from the article and also the spoken word poem? Hi, thank you for having me. Um, you know, contemporary is a, is a Contemporary Issues is a class that I get to develop the curriculum for. And it's a class where I get to introduce students to uh, a variety of perspectives. And, you know, what better perspectives to, to listen to in, in a school that's almost entirely white, in, in a county that's almost entirely white, than uh, an award-winning author, ta Coates, and uh, an avant-garde poet, Kyla Janae Lacey. Um, you know, my class is where we investigate the claims that people make. And ta Coates makes claims in that essay. Kyla Janae Lacey makes claims in that essay. And so I allow my students to form their own ideas about about what they say and allow them to research and either validate or invalidate those claims. Now, in its termination letter, the school wrote, and I want to quote here, concepts like white privilege remain perfectly appropriate, but in addition to accusing you of not offering varying points of view, they also objected to the inappropriate language in the video. As you might suspect, much of this video is too profanity laced for us to put it on air. Would you say that the school and some of the parents really were all that off base for raising that concern? You know, I think anytime parents are concerned uh, is a good thing, or, or whenever parents get involved in students' education is a good thing. Um, you know, that poem, the language in that poem was redacted. You know, every student that testified at my appeal in August, they testified to that very thing. And so, 
um, whenever we get uncomfortable, you know, by these very powerful pieces, we have to really ask ourselves, what are we uncomfortable by? You know, if the language is redacted, and we're talking about upperclassmen students, you know, high school juniors and seniors, and in a school that reads Toni Morrison, you know, that reads Catcher in the Rye, that reads um, To Kill a Mockingbird. And so, um, you know, I would just kind of maybe take a little issue with that and, and say, look, I did my job to present these students with a varying viewpoint and tried to or did redact the language in that, in, and, in keeping with the reprimand. Yeah, I just want to follow up on that because you're saying it was redacted. You're saying that you didn't play any profanity. The school says you did. Why would there even be a discrepancy between? I mean, it's either you did or you didn't. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I pr press mute, mute as the profanity was, was being played. And so um, a couple slipped through, but you know the fact that I tried to do that, that I attempted to do that, um, I think it it says a lot about you know what I do as a teacher and and the care and the time that I took into it. You know that's actually kind of a very difficult thing to do. It may sound easy, but it's very difficult. You said that you were not teaching critical race theory, but even so, Tennessee now has a law restricting how race and racism is taught in schools. So one part of that law says that you can't teach uh, that, quote, an individual by virtue of the individual's race or sex is inherently privileged, racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or subconsciously. Is it fair to say, then, that you disagree with Tennessee's law and by teaching your students that white privilege is a fact, were you then intentionally in violation of this ban? Well, that law was passed the same day that I was, it passed our legislature the same day that I was given dismissal papers. And I never told that class white privilege is a fact. I let Kyla Janae Lacey give my students her experiences. Have students yeah. come back overwhelmingly supporting you and disappointed that you got fired? Oh, absolutely. You know, um, this has been a very, very difficult uh, time for me. Um, it's, uh, you know, I've lost my livelihood. I've lost, you know, the, the profession that I care so deeply about, you know, I, I deeply care for the well-being of my students. And fortunately I've had a 16 year career of, of being a good teacher to students and they have came out and supported me. And I would like to thank them for that. Thank them for, uh, you know, all the, the messages and text messages and, and messages on social media that they have sent me thanking me for being a good teacher to them. And, and they remind me of, of little instances that we had in class that, you know, I don't necessarily remember, but I can remember their voices. And it, and it takes me back to a time and a place that that brings me a lot of uh, joy and happiness. So so I'm very appreciative to those students who, who have reached out. Matthew Hahn, we thank you so much for your time and your, your thoughts. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Still ahead here on Prime, the deadly crash into the Niagara River, the car 50 feet from the edge of those famous falls. How in the world did this happen? Another lawmaker whose family is posing with guns and the fresh backlash. And the alarming study, too many not going into the doctor for cancer screenings during the pandemic. The consequences at times are fatal. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, some good news. Tiger Woods heading back on the course to play with his son in the PNC Championship. An extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Christopher Steele, the guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. 
This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. If you don't want to shave your legs, don't. I was gonna say, oh my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Alec Baldwin made news when he spoke out for the first time. And now, Friday night. Why was Alec Baldwin handed a gun with live ammunition? This bullet goes off. Then there was a scream. Oh, my God. I was told I was handed an empty gun. Who is to blame? Why do shocking tragedies keep happening on movie sets? After the shock, I became angry. Someone losing their life again. New reporting, new details. The new 2020 event special, Friday night on ABC. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasure that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. Five, this is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back, everyone. Now to a new report by the American Cancer Society that confirms what we suspected, that during the pandemic, Americans were skipping their regular cancer screenings, which led to a drop in cancer diagnoses and potentially worse outcomes for many patients. We take a look by the numbers. Colonoscopies used to detect colon cancer decreased by 45% in 2020, according to this study, which looked at the veteran population. Prostate biopsies to detect prostate cancer decreased by 29%. Chest CT scans used to detect lung cancer decreased by 10%, and tests to diagnose bladder cancer decreased by 21%. The study found that these backlogs continued to accumulate throughout 2020, even after COVID restrictions were loosened. Many cancer diagnoses were likely delayed more than six months due to the pandemic, according to the researchers. This dramatic drop in cancer care could in part explain why early data from cities like New York show an increase in non-COVID-related mortality during the early COVID-19 surge, according to the study. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. What do you think the top Google searches were this year? We have the answers and the deeply personal family conversation about picking cotton that went viral. It's this week's TikTok. But first, we'll look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. time, anytime, Nightline. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. 
There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Alec Baldwin made news when he spoke out for the first time. And now, Friday night. Why was Alec Baldwin handed a gun with live ammunition? This bullet goes off. Then there was a scream. Oh, my God. I was told I was handed an empty gun. Who is to blame? Why do shocking tragedies keep happening on movie sets? After the shock, I became angry. Someone losing their life again. New reporting, new details. The new 2020 event special, Friday night on ABC. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is Three, all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by no people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Pfizer vaccine efficacy could be compromised with the new Omicron variant. The drug company releasing a study indicating Omicron likely chips away at its vaccine's effectiveness. But the shots still provide some protection, especially against severe disease, and the third booster dose appears to significantly offset the variant's impact. At the moment, at least the preliminary data, doesn't indicate that this is more severe. In fact, if anything, the direction is towards less severity. But again, that's early days and we have to be very careful. If you've got nothing, no vaccine, not previously infected, I'm not sure that it's gonna be a milder disease for you. Nationwide, daily COVID deaths up 57% in the last week. Hospital admissions up 10% overall and 20% among children. And those numbers, largely fueled by the Delta variant, are only expected to go up in the colder months. An alarming sight along the beaches of Cancun. One day after armed men on jet skis began firing guns into the air, members of the Mexican Navy are now patrolling the shore. No one was wounded in yesterday's shooting, reportedly involving members of a drug cartel. I'm not overly concerned by it because we've been in Cancun for 31 years, you know, coming down for 31 years. We've never had any issues. And because it was going up into the air and they took off and nobody got hurt, I was not overly concerned with it. More than 400 members of Mexico's National Guard assigned to the newly formed Tourist Battalion, protecting the resort areas. This all comes just a month after two suspected gang members were killed in a shooting near a Cancun resort. In Niagara Falls, a car plunged into the Niagara River and was nearing the edge of the American side of the falls. A Coast Guard helicopter was called in and a crew member was dropped into the partially submerged vehicle. That is where they discovered a woman in her 60s had died. Authorities are now trying to figure out how to remove the car from the water. At this time, the uh, investigation into the reason the female driver went into the river is still ongoing. Representative Lauren Boebert stirring up a new controversy with this image shared from her social media page. The Republican lawmaker from Colorado pictured with her young children in front of the family Christmas tree, armed and smiling. The image in support of Representative Thomas Massey, who posted a similar photo of his family on social media. Boebert sharing the image on Twitter with the caption, the Boeberts have your six, Representative Massey. Currently, some House progressives are seeking to strip Boebert of her committee assignments after making anti-Muslim remarks against Representative Ilhan Omar. The closer we get, the more of these things that we do, we're on the, the launch tower and walking across the bridge, ringing the bell, the more you know that this is the reality. So 
very excited, ready to go. Windy conditions in Texas have delayed Blue Origin's third crude launch. ABC's Michael Strahan and five others are now scheduled to blast off from Van Horn Saturday morning. Crew members will finish their final day of training today. Time for another yearly roundup, this one from Google, revealing what we searched for the most in 2021. Topping the list, the NBA. The number two top trending search in the U.S. went to the late rapper DMX, who died in April after suffering a heart attack. Number three went to Gabby Petito, a blogger who was murdered. Number four went to Kyle Rittenhouse, the teen acquitted after killing two people during protests in Kenosha. And number five went to Brian Laundrie, Petito's boyfriend who was later found dead after she went missing. Other trending topics, the Mega Millions lottery, stimulus checks, the Georgia Senate race, and the Netflix smash hit, Squid Game. Welcome back, everyone. Now to that high-stakes video call between President Biden and Vladimir Putin. President Biden said today he's confident Putin got the message. Putin called the talks open and constructive, but on the border with Ukraine, tensions remain high. Our Ian panel is there for us once again tonight. Tonight, President Biden saying Russian President Putin, quote, got the message after their video call on Ukraine. I made it very clear. If, in fact, he invades... Ukraine. There will be severe consequences. ABC News tonight given exclusive access to Ukrainian forces training with U.S. supplied Javelin anti-tank missiles. This is part of what Vladimir Putin means by a red line. What he sees as America's, NATO's growing involvement in Ukraine. Tensions still high, as we saw on the front lines where Ukrainian forces are fighting with Russian-backed rebels. You hear the sound of rapid automatic gunfire there. They're telling us to go. We were so close to the front, you could only whisper. The Russian backs up because they're literally about 50 yards, maybe less, just on the other side there. And beyond those lines, at the border, as many as 100,000 Russian troops are now massed. So, Lindsay, both sides have now given a much fuller account of that over two-hour video conference between Presidents Putin and Biden. I think it's fair to say that the mood appears to have lifted slightly from both sides, from the Kremlin and from the White House. But in reality, their positions are implacably different. However, we're expecting by Friday President Biden to announce a high-level meeting involving some NATO allies and Russia to try and discuss the Kremlin's concerns. There is an opportunity there and perhaps an off-ramp to end this crisis. Lindsay? Ian, thank you. Many of you will likely remember Scott Peterson. He was convicted of murdering his pregnant wife, Lacey Peterson, nearly 20 years ago. He was back in court today for a resentencing hearing as Lacey Peterson's still grieving family watched on. Here's ABC's Kena Whitworth with the details. It was a case that horrified the nation. And tonight, Scott Peterson is back in court. Long after the Christmas Eve murders of his wife Lacey and unborn son, Scott Peterson in court today because the California Supreme Court overturned Peterson's death sentence last year, ruling jurors in his original trial were improperly screened for bias about the death penalty. Because of that, Peterson no longer faces the death penalty. The judge today resentencing him to life in prison without parole. And Lacey Peterson's heartbroken family, once again, finding themselves in court with the man who killed their daughter. Lacey's mother confronting him, telling him, quote, Lacey and Connor will always be dead and you will always be their murderer. Peterson sitting in silence. Lacey's sister in tears telling him, it makes me sick being here today in front of you again. Nearly 20 years ago, Peterson admitted to an affair, but denied the killings in an exclusive interview with Diane Sawyer. Did you murder your wife? No, no, uh, I just thought. Tonight, Peterson's attorney maintaining his innocence and saying the judge denied his client's request to speak at the hearing. He wanted to make it clear that there is no way he could have possibly harmed Lacey and Connor. Kana Whitworth joins us now. And Kana, Scott Peterson still trying to get his conviction overturned? 
He is, Lindsay. In fact, his lawyer is asking for a new trial here, again citing juror misconduct, but this time pointing specifically to a female juror that they say was untruthful in a questionnaire. They say specifically she did not disclose the fact that she herself had been involved in an abusive relationship. Now, that juror does deny that, but again, those are the grounds that his lawyer is seeking for this new trial, and they have a hearing for that, Lindsay, in February. Kana Whitworth, our thanks to you. We turn now to an emotional moment from Hillary Clinton today. For the first time, reading the speech she had hoped to deliver had she won the 2016 presidential election. My fellow Americans, today you sent a message to the whole world. As part of her new masterclass series, Mrs. Clinton talks about the message that would have been sent to young boys and girls who had asked why a woman hadn't been president before. She reveals she was going to talk at length about her mother, Dorothy, who had been abandoned by her parents, who put her on a train to California when she was just a girl, and who ended up working as a housemaid. I think about my mother every day. Sometimes I think about her on that train. I dream of going up to her. <laughs> and sitting down next to her, taking her in my arms and saying, look at me, listen to me. You will survive. You will have a good family of your own and three children. And as hard as it might be to imagine, your daughter will grow up and become the president of the United States. Mrs. Clinton reveals she never did write a concession speech, saying that while there were tough days toward the end of the campaign, she still believed she would pull through. We turn now to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we interview some of our favorite TikTokers, taking a closer look at the story behind the sensation. And tonight we have a very special guest joining us to share a piece of black history. 104-year-old grandmother Maddie Scott has become a viral phenomenon after her granddaughter Shanika shared a story time video where she asks Miss Scott about her experience picking cotton as a teenager. The video quickly made headlines, grabbing the attention of many, including singer like Lizzo and Nicki Minaj. Let's take a listen. This is what I do. I lay up here and think about it. what I done. God brought me to. Mm -hmm. I go back when I was doing all that work mm -hmm. and, 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 and cotton, you play. Yeah. It's got seed. Right. And I used to go to the field with mama, my mama. Mm -hmm. You chop cotton. That's chopping it this way. Mm -hmm. And you, then when you do it, you your bunch garden, you do it this way. Mm -hmm. I know all the tricks. Don't want that <laughs> <laughs> We love that you look back and think about all that God has brought you through. Miss Scott and Shanika, we thank you so much for joining us tonight. And happy birthday, Miss Scott, 104 years old today. Yeah, say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so in the viral video, Shanika, we can hear you asking your grandmother questions about her life in Georgia as a sharecropper. Uh, certainly a somber conversation to have. Uh, what have you learned since documenting your grandmother's stories? What I have learned is today, in today's society, we have it good. Mm -hmm. Like, we have the best life because back then, people have endured some of the hardest things I have ever heard of. Because I don't think that I could have survived back then. I don't know. Oh, yes, she could. <laughs> uh, your grandmother yeah. says you could have. So, Miss Scott, in your TikToks, you discussed the day-to-day -day reality of sharecropping and picking cotton in Georgia at that time. What do you hope that people take away from your story that, that may have gotten lost in the history books? <laughs> these, these people today, so they said, no, ain't no, ain't no one in the world that can survive what we went through with. But they not they ain't strong like we was. And so, Shanika, why is it important for you to share these personal videos of your grandmother? And what kind of response are you getting? Um, it's very important because, you know, a lot of us, well, our generation, some and under us, we really don't know how, you know, older people had, had it back then. And I shared the video so people could get the knowledge and hear it firsthand that, you know, picking cotton, working with smooth and eyes, like we have it really, really good. And also, it's just to put the knowledge out there firsthand from people actually 
um, understanding what some of us, grand, our grandmothers, our great grandmothers, what we went, what they went through as children, as adults, and just to say, hey, in today's society, we have it good coming up. We did not go through all those hard times, so we should be grateful for the older people who have paved the way for us today. You've certainly paved the way, Miss Scott, 104 years old. Once again, as we said, today is your birthday. Any wisdom that you would like to share with our audience, all that you've learned over the years, what, what kind of advice can you give us? What advice could you give to the young people? You can't give them nothing. <laughs> I didn't have to do it because they don't know. They don't know nothing about nothing. It's like it's fun. It ain't fun. But get, tell them what can they do. What can they do to live as long as you? <laughs> what can well, they do? Work hard and, and to me, that's how I got. Look, I work hard every day. Fields. Mm -hmm. What else? Go to bed early. I went to bed early. <laughs> get up early in the morning and, and go to work. They can live a long time and and don't drink and don't be smoking <laughs> and, and 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 don't act like a bunch of clowns. <laughs> you know, that's what they act like now nah, to me. A bunch of clowns. <laughs> Somebody said something to them. They read it. Don't tell me that. <laughs> Ready to kill them. See, when I was coming up, people live happy. Right. You're absolutely right. They All right. To church. I, oh, go to church as well. I think I got my list. Don't act like a clown. Don't drink. Don't smoke. Go to bed early. Last night, the show didn't. They didn't. What about, what about me? I don't even know. I'm a grown woman and old lady and don't know nothing about dope. <laughs> Today. <laughs> And, and, and they kill themselves. <laughs> well, happy birthday, Miss Birthday Queen, Miss Scott. We thank you so much for those words of wisdom. Great uh, speaking with both of you today. And again, happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was fun. And before we go tonight, our image of the day, which is also fun, this dinosaur in London's Natural History Museum Clearly in the holiday spirit, complete with ugly Christmas sweater and all with those little sleeves for the T-Rex's tiny arms. Someone certainly had fun dressing him or her up for the holidays. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Next hour, our series One World, One Pandemic. Tonight, our look at Africa, the first continent to report Omicron. And the Grinch bots threatening our holiday cheer. Stay with us. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Alec Baldwin made news when he spoke out for the first time. And now, Friday night. Why was Alec Baldwin handed a gun with live ammunition? This bullet goes off. And there was a scream. Oh, my God. I was told I was handed an empty gun. Who is to blame? Why do shocking tragedies keep happening on movie sets? After the shock, I became angry. Someone losing their life again. New reporting, new details. The new 2020 event special, Friday night on ABC. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. 
What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Winner of nine Edward R. Murrow Awards, more than any other network, including winning for the third straight year the award for overall excellence in television. ABC News is America's number one news source. With so much at stake, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one newscast and the number one program on television. Lindsay Davis, thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. President Biden has signed an executive order pledging to make the U.S. government carbon neutral by 2050. He's directing the federal government to move forward on 100% carbon pollution free and zero emission vehicles by 2030 as well. Of course, executive orders can be overturned depending on who is the occupant of the White House. Congress is on track to avert the first ever U.S. default on its debt. Leaders of both parties parties agreed to an unusual maneuver to bypass a Republican blockade before the December 15th deadline, a one-time law requiring the party in charge of both chambers of Congress and the White House to raise the debt limit on its own to pay America's bills. The Democrats taking responsibility, though nearly 98 percent of the debt predates the Biden administration. And the FBI is investigating a shootout at Rocky Mountain National Park. Authorities say it began with a traffic stop and ended with a park ranger being shot in the vest. One suspect was shot and wounded. A second was uninjured. Both are under arrest and the ranger is said to be okay. But we begin this hour with a look at COVID-19 in Africa. In recent days with the spread of the Omicron variant, many Americans were reminded that this is a global fight. And if one part of the globe is struggling to contain the virus, it could have consequences for us all. In Africa, where the variant was first reported, vaccine skepticism remains high and the availability of doses remains low. In our week-long series, One World, One Pandemic, ABC's Matt Gutman shows us the challenges on the continent that may impact us all. In the townships of South Africa's most populated province, rumors have been spreading almost as fast as Omicron. There's numerous uh, reasons why people don't want to vaccinate. Um, others are afraid, others is about the rumors. We continue with our breaking news story this afternoon. A new COVID-19 variant has been confirmed in the country. COVID's newest and possibly most contagious variant, Omicron, sweeping through Southern Africa's wealthiest nation. The total cases in South Africa rising 500% in just two weeks. And the timing could not be worse for the continent's 54 nations. We are also entering the festive season where there is a massive movement of population, people gathering together. The virus erupting just as South Africa, a nation of 60 million, emerged battered from the Delta variant. We were going through a period of actually much lower level transmission of the virus. And we were getting optimistic that, that we might have a bit of respite again. Omicron now accounts for a vast majority of the cases in South Africa and has reached at least 10 other African nations, including the French territory of Réunion. And the epicenter of the epicenter is South Africa's Hauteng province, home of the megacity Johannesburg. Omicron is now dominant in Hauteng. Cases here are seven times higher than the nation's other provinces. I think I want to celebrate. I think people here have all lost hope when it comes to protection from COVID-19. I think many of them have developed the mindset that whatever happens, happens. They have lost hope and are not worried about this new variant as compared to the one before. Shockingly, the possibility of Omicron's rise was predicted. Back in September, Dr. Lessels and a team of doctors wrote a paper on COVID in Africa. The last sentence in his team's abstract warned, Africa must not be left behind in the global pandemic response. Otherwise, it could become a source for new variants. Is there a, you know, a top five, top three 
to-do list for the developed world in order to help uh, in, in what's coming in Africa? Vaccines, vaccines, vaccines. But fulfilling that top three is an uphill battle. Dr. Mfosha Bangu has been leading a push to get shots in arms in Mamalodi, about an hour outside of Johannesburg. All hands are on the deck. So what we are doing currently, we are trying also to make sure that we take vaccines to, to the people. We go and, and have a pop-up site in an area so that people can come and vaccinate. But apathy looms large. Many residents here seem to be in no rush to get vaccinated. I haven't vaccinated because I've been sick. I'm always occupied. I'm always occupied. I'm afraid of corona also. I'm afraid of vaccination. I'm not against it though. I will vaccinate, but not, not any time soon. We are actually experiencing a, a lot of a vaccine hesitancy. I think it's not that people don't want to be vaccinated. People just need uh, more information on, 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 on the vaccines, especially on the issue of the safety. Just about one-fourth of South Africa's population has been fully vaccinated so far. It is now one of two nations on the continent that has obtained more doses than willing arms to put them in. We know countries, there are a few countries in Africa that have discarded some of the uh, doses. And uh, the, the simple reason is that uh, um, these countries received vaccines that are uh, near expiring uh, with a very short shelf, shelf life. As it stands, only 7% of Africa's population has been vaccinated, according to Africa CDC. The World Health Organization's milestone to have 40% of the continent's population vaccinated by the end of the year now seems hopelessly out of reach. More shipments of vaccine are coming in, but logistical hurdles are hampering their deployment. In Kenya, where just 14% of the country is inoculated. Five million shots arrived just within the past two weeks. That news sent people like Julius Tayuto hiking miles through the bush to a clinic, only to be sent home unvaccinated. Well, while we were still standing there, we were told the vaccine was over. So I was discharged and was not interested in following it up again. We ran out of uh, stock uh, five days ago. We, we, we have already, already ordered our supply again. In larger cities like Nairobi, misinformation and skepticism deterring some from rolling up their sleeves. Salon owner Godfrey Male says he's still not convinced. Two of my friends got vaccinated. After a few days, they caught virus. <laughs> you can be vaccinated and you can get virus again. So it's, it's nothing. And continent-wide, the shortfalls, not just in terms of access to doses, but also medical supplies. In October, UNICEF projected that Africa could be short 2.2 billion syringes in 2022, a crucial blow to administering shots. And that as a silent online killer stalks the continent. We've seen in um, uh, some countries really where um, um, the uh, influence uh, or misinformation that has been spreading through the uh, social media has had some devastating uh, um, hmm. uh, effects in terms of uh, um, acceptance of, of, of vaccination. Some of this misinformation being disseminated on social media is literally responsible for killing people? Yeah, I think uh, I think we can say that uh, with, with, without any doubt. Countries like Burundi vaccinating only 0.01% of the population. A combination of delays from the government and hesitancy. Still, back in South Africa, Dr. Shabongu says she is seeing glimmers of hope. With this uh, increased number of uh, cases uh, in, in our district, uh, in, in the entire province, now we are seeing that uh, there is actually uh, an increased number of people who are coming in our vaccination sites. And as Omicron spreads, despite its travel restrictions, the emergence of a new variant is a reminder of how connected we are. What's the most important lesson that the rest of the world can learn from South Africa's experience so far? Just a very simple lesson that this is a global pandemic and it needs a global response and we're all in this together and, and we need to act responsibly as a, as a global community.
All in this together, that's for sure. Our thanks to Matt. Be sure to tune in to COVID-19 One World, One Pandemic, Friday at 8 Eastern, right here on ABC News Live. Switching gears now to the dramatic first day of trial of former Minnesota police officer Kim Potter. She shot and killed Dante right during a traffic stop, appearing to mistake her handgun for her taser. Today, we heard opening statements and Wright's grieving mother took the stand. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Tonight, an emotional start to the criminal trial of former police officer Kim Potter, accused in the death of 20-year-old Dante Wright. Potter, a 26-year veteran of the police department, in the courtroom today. She faces first and second degree manslaughter charges after shooting Wright in the chest last April. The defense says she mistook her taser for her gun. Katie Bryant, Wright's mother, called as the prosecution's first witness. I wanted to protect him because that's what mothers do. Bryant detailing the last phone call with her son as he was pulled over for an air freshener in the rearview mirror, which is illegal in Minnesota, and an expired tag. He just sounded really nervous, but I reassured him that it would be okay. The call abruptly ending. That mother later making a video call. A woman in the car with Wright answering the phone. She said that they shot him. And she faced the phone towards the driver's seat. <laughs> and my son was laying there. He was unresponsive and he, he looked dead. <laughs> Bryant rushing to the scene. I didn't want to believe that that was my son laying there on the ground, but I could tell it was him because of his tennis shoes. <laughs> During that traffic stop, Wright struggled with officers who were attempting to apprehend him after discovering an outstanding warrant for his arrest. Potter pulling out a firearm. <laughs> Realizing she had shot right as the car drove off. Our thanks to Stephanie Ramos for that. Contempt charges against Donald Trump's former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. After initially agreeing to do so, Meadows abruptly stopped cooperating with the panel and did not show up for his deposition scheduled for today. He's now suing Nancy Pelosi and members of the January 6th committee. ABC's Faith Abube has the very latest. Former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, a no-show for his Wednesday deposition in front of the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. His absence coming just a day after Chairman Benny Thompson threatened that if Meadows failed to appear, the Select Committee would be, quote, left no choice but to advance contempt proceedings against him and recommend that the body in which Meadows once served refer him for criminal prosecution. Meadows could become the first former House member to be referred referred to the Department of Justice for criminal contempt of Congress by the full House. Committee member P. Aguilar telling CNN until his recent about face, Meadows had been cooperating with the panel. That's an individual who provided a, a lot of information um, already to the committee. And so we have uh, over 6,000 pieces of information, text messages, documents uh, that, that uh, he was a part of. Uh, that will aid in our investigative efforts. According to the committee, the documents Meadows has turned over reveal the former White House chief of staff was messaging an unnamed member of Congress about appointing an alternate slate of electors from key states to overturn the 2020 election results. Meadows allegedly responding, quote, I love it. His attorney defending Meadows' decision to stop cooperating with the panel, saying the committee has made it untenable for his client to cooperate by not respecting boundaries concerning executive privilege. It's pretty hard to say as a claim of privilege when he turned over information right. as well as wrote a book about the contents of, of what we're discussing. And ABC News has learned former Trump advisor Roger Stone, who was subpoenaed by the committee, plans to invoke his Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. Meanwhile, the panel says it has interviewed more than 270 witnesses who are helping them connect the dots on what led to the Capitol attack. Our thanks to Faith. We turn next to the sex trafficking trial of Delane Maxwell. Jurors today saw new images of Maxwell with Jeffrey Epstein appearing to be a happy couple. Prosecutors even calling them partners in crime. Jurors also heard the graphic and difficult testimony of a third accuser who took the stand. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. 
Tonight, these newly released images of Ghislaine Maxwell embracing Jeffrey Epstein, capturing a seemingly happy, wealthy, globe-trotting couple. Prosecutors presenting these photographs during the socialites' sex trafficking trial as they try to paint the two as partners in crime, with Maxwell allegedly leveraging her glamorous lifestyle to recruit and groom girls for sex with Epstein. The trial in its eighth day, with three accusers so far taking the stand. The latest alleged victim identified by her first name, Carolyn, claiming that she was just 14 years old when she first went to Epstein's home with a friend. After they arrived, Maxwell allegedly telling the friend, you can bring her upstairs and show her what to do. Carolyn testifying that Maxwell scheduled some of her explicit massages with Epstein and that on one or two occasions, Maxwell handed her the $300 payments. Good morning, Jeffrey. How do you think it's going? But Maxwell's defense team pointing to inconsistencies in Carolyn's story and questioning why she didn't implicate Maxwell until funds from Epstein's estate became available. I didn't bump into Minnesota man will never forget his interaction with his local bank after he walked in to cash his paycheck after a 12-hour shift. He then gave it to the bank teller who believed it was fake, as did the bank manager. They told him to be calm in the incident captured on body camera as he tried to provide proof the check was real, which it was. The man was later put in handcuffs and was described as threatening. His bank disputed his allegations that this was a case of racial profiling, but after our local Minnesota station, KSTP reached out they reached a confidential settlement with him. It's been just over a week since the tragic Oxford High School shooting, and with more than 650 mass shootings in the U.S. this year, one company is tackling the issue, creating an alert system that could shave critical time off police response times. ABC's Victor Akendo has the details. All units be advised, active shooter. You're looking at what police say is new, potentially life-saving technology. The suspect went down the first left hallway. I just saw the officers going down the hallway there, and she's guiding them every step of the way. Pre-pandemic, ABC News getting an exclusive look at a demonstration of ALERT, active law enforcement response technology being used in schools and now businesses across 14 states. ALERT gives police access to real-time surveillance cameras within a building once a panic button is hit during an active incident. They can then identify and track a suspect's location, relaying that information to officers as they respond. This streamlines everything from communication to surveillance. Lee Mandel began developing the program after the tragedy at Sandy Hook. It really hit home, and we said, how can we make a difference? When they arrive on the scene, they know exactly where to go, how to get in, where the shooter is. Andrew Pollack lost his daughter Meadow at Parkland. Since then, he's been involved in legislative efforts, but says his overriding mission is school safety. If this type of software was in place, she'd be alive today. There were so many failures that day. Pollock creating the school safety grant, which provides unlimited funding to make the software available nationwide free of charge. And then not just in schools, hospitals, movie theaters, houses of worship, anywhere where people gather, those grants will cover the full implementation, full deployment, and all the software for life. Alert now provided to more than 50 entities nationwide, including health facilities, a sporting arena, and police departments. The first recipient, Coral Springs Police. They were the first to enter the school the day of the Parkland shooting. It's life-changing. It's taking us from being in a rowboat to being in a starship. Pearl Springs Charter School, just two miles from Stoneman Douglas, also a recipient. I would hope that most schools have the opportunity to look into this. The shooter is going to be going to the left. ABC News right there as officers used alert for the first time last year. All units be advised. During the drill, the dispatcher immediately alerts police, then takes over the school's PA system. Shooter, drop your weapon. She relays crucial information. Suspect's going to be a white male with a black shirt and camel pants. With the school on lockdown, she can unlock the door for police. Copy, unlocking the door. As officers rush to the scene, she tracks the shooter. The suspect should be in the first hallway to the left. He's close to the middle school bathrooms. You're walking towards the suspect. That's a gun! The suspect apprehended in less than four minutes. God forbid that technology has to be used. Mm -hmm. Do you think it could help save lives? Absolutely, 100%. This is the future of responding. My daughter will be saying, well, look what we did now, Daddy.
doing something about it. Our thanks to Victor. How to holiday, sh now to holiday shopping watch and a new hiccup in getting the gifts on your list. Computer programs being called Grinch bots are grabbing the hottest products before real people can actually buy them. And ABC's Becky Worley got an inside look at how these bots work and how you can beat them. <laughs> Just like this Grinch, Grinch bots are really messing with online gift purchases. How? Well, if it's hot, I'm talking PS5s, Yeezys, luxury purses. It's been bought by a Grinch bot. A bot is simply a system of computers um, that are basically trying to purchase things from a website. Jason Kent, a security researcher at Sequence Security, says bots pounce on popular products fast and then resell them at a markup. How fast does all that happen? So if it takes you 30 seconds to get through the website, if you're doing it as fast as you can, a bot can do it in about three. And they're gonna win every time. They'll win every single time. Jason replays a bot attack that happened to one of his clients when they released a hot product. The bots are here. I can see they're lighting up. Now, what am I seeing? It looks like there's normal traffic, then it starts to increase, and then it gets really huge. This particular attack, in the 30 minutes that they were online, they got six million requests. So these Grinch bots come from organized groups who have lots of resources. This is big business. It could be five people working in a group. It could be 50. Um, and there's various pieces of the attack that have to be coordinated. Is this illegal? That's a great question. Um, is it illegal today? No. Just last week, legislation to outlaw this bot activity was introduced in the House. Back in 2019, similar laws were proposed, but went nowhere. Not a day goes by that we don't see a billion uh, plus uh, malicious requests from bots. It's a very large scale problem day in and day out. Web companies like Akamai, who support big retailers, say they're playing a cat and mouse game, figure out who's a bot and who's a human. One giveaway is mouse movement. This simulation shows the cursor activity of a bot on an e-commerce site. It's very linear, but then I try it and whoa, I look well, distracted. And while companies are fighting back. It is almost a perfect storm of we're creating too much uh, demand and not enough supply. All right, thanks to Becky Worley for that. And still to come, the chopper crash that claimed the life of a high-ranking official in India. And Will Smith takes us on a journey. Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Alec Baldwin made news when he spoke out for the first time. And now, Friday night. Why was Alec Baldwin handed a gun with live ammunition? This bullet goes off. Then there was a scream. Oh, my God. I was told I was handed an empty gun. Who is to blame? Why do shocking tragedies keep happening on movie sets? After the shock, I became angry. Someone losing their life again. New reporting, new details. The new 2020 event special, Friday night on ABC. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. Where the sky he put his family himself in jeopardy for us. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? 
Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Welcome back, everyone. We are tracking several headlines around the world. An investigation is now underway to figure out what led to a deadly helicopter crash that killed India's military chief. The general and 12 others died in the accident, but one officer did manage to survive and is being treated in a military hospital. An advisor to British Prime Minister Boris Johnson quit after a video surfaced of her laughing and joking about a party during a Christmas COVID lockdown last year when such activities were banned. She apologized for her action and Prime Minister Johnson said he was furious about the video but was told a party never happened. And soccer titan Pele was hospitalized to receive treatment for a colon tumor in Sao Paulo. He's said to be in stable condition and should be discharged in the coming days he had a tumor on the right side of his colon removed in September. Now to Will Smith's new series, Welcome to Earth. The superstar travels with National Geographic experts around the planet, even facing his fears as he explores six of the world's most amazing natural wonders. ABC's TJ Holmes sat with Will Smith to discuss his experience. We think we know our planet. What do you get when you combine one of the world's biggest superstars? That's spectacular. This is a bucket list moment. With planet Earth's most spectacular sights. I asked the best modern day explorers, take me to the ends of the Earth. And they said, oh, we can go further than that. Welcome to Earth, the new Disney Plus original series produced by National Geographic. What was that? There's only one way to find out. Will Smith embarks on an epic adventure from the deepest reaches of the ocean oh, oh my God. to the inside of a lava spewing volcano. And we need the helmet because the volcano spits rocks up in the air as if this helmet's going to do something <laughs> for one of these big rocks. I've been in a thousand meters down to the the you know below the midnight zone in the ocean with translucent fish like it, it was <laughs> uh, yeah it, it's it, it's been quite a journey i hope that they will have me for the rest of my life i'll do that forever smith leans into his fears as he descends into a seemingly endless chasm did you hear that crack yeah it's just constantly moving this is the kind of thing that Afro people would say nightmares are made of. You're climbing down into an environment that's constantly changing and yeah, shifting, yeah, yeah. and there's water filling in there. Are you mad? Yeah. That's the question. Ha half of us think that. <laughs> <laughs> Guiding him on the journey. My name is Will. National Geographic explorers from across the globe. Will, you happy to go lower? You got it. Now look down. Isn't that something? That hole just drops away into infinity. <laughs> there is nothing I enjoy more than those Nat Geo explorations. <laughs> there is nothing wow. I enjoy more than going to the ends of the earth with some wise explorer, the things that I've seen and got an opportunity to do on that show, it is the deepest and greatest pleasure of my life. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot, because you've done a lot. Yeah, you got to come hang with me on one of them. Whoa, 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 whoa. Can yeah, I, no, can listen. I pick the adventure, though? We went down into a volcano. I'm going to skip that one. Right. What else you got? What else you got? <laughs> <laughs> Give me other options. Yeah, no. <laughs> Sounds and looks fascinating. Our thanks to TJ Holmes for that. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us from a very snowy New York City. Have a great night.
extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed